On Thursday, November 21, 1912, Ella Barham was raped, murdered, and dismembered in broad daylight near a well-traveled area in a quiet, rural Ozarks farm community called Pleasant Ridge, located 18 miles east of Harrison, the county seat of Boone County, Arkansas. She was a vivacious and popular 18-year-old, and her brutal death shocked the people of the Ozarks, devastated many lives, and left an indelible mark on Boone County's history. Two local men were arrested, and following a sensational trial, one of them, Otis Davidson, was convicted. However, in many people's minds, the crime remains unsolved, and divergent stories and legends about it persist to this day. Ella Barham's murder and Otis Davidson's trial and appeal made national headlines. Davidson's appeal is cited as a precedent in numerous court cases. Attorneys in Atlanta, Georgia, reviewed Davidson's case brief to prepare an appeal to the United States Supreme Court for Leo Frank, a young Jewish man, who was convicted in 1913 of murdering 13-year-old Mary Fagan at the National Pencil Company in Atlanta, where both were employed. The circumstances surrounding Davidson's trial in Harrison, Arkansas, and Leo Frank's trial in Atlanta, Georgia, were eerily similar. Ella Barham was my first cousin, twice removed. Her father, George Solomon Barham, and my great-grandfather, Elias Barham, were brothers. I first learned about Ella during a trip with my parents in the early 1980s. We had gone to Zinc, Arkansas to help my aunt and uncle restore Elias Barham's two-story home, which they had recently purchased. Mother and my aunt were the only children of Elias's oldest son, Elliot, and his wife, Anna. The girls were born and reared in their parents' home, a mere stone's throw from their grandfather Elias's house. As children and young adults, my brother and I spent many summers in zinc with our grandmother. It felt like home. When grandmother died in 1980, she gave her house to my aunt and it was our family's base camp while we restored Elias's house. On this particular trip, Mother took me to the nearby Davidson Cemetery to see great-grandfather Elias's grave. It was my first time to visit a country cemetery, and I did not know what to expect. My grandparents were buried in Harrison's Maplewood Cemetery, and the only other cemeteries I had seen were in Tulsa, Oklahoma, large, well-manicured places with lush green grass, clean, sturdy headstones, and lots of beautiful flowers. To get to Davidson Cemetery, Mother and I had to drive three miles out of zinc on an unpaved backwoods road, sloshing through creeks and bouncing up and down as the car jutted across ruts. When we arrived at the cemetery, I quickly realized it was like nothing I'd ever seen before. There were no nearby houses and not a soul in sight, at least none that I could see. The metal gate creaked as we opened it and walked through. Woods loomed on three sides. Oak and walnut trees filled the center of the cemetery. Their gnarly, leafy branches cast shadows onto the old gravestones, some of which were broken. The ground was uneven. Many of the graves had sunk in on themselves. The place was thick with weeds and overgrown grass. A pack of stray dogs snarled and roamed near the back wire fence. I was terrified. We walked along the west side towards the back of the cemetery, and periodically I turned around to look at our big, safe Oldsmobile. With every step we took, it grew smaller and smaller. Undaunted, Mother trudged ahead. Eventually, she stopped at the Barham family plot. I was surprised to see so many graves. 
As she pointed to each stone and told me who rested beneath, my fear lessened and curiosity took hold. She patiently answered my many questions, and then, all at once, I saw Ella's stone. She died so young. What happened to her? I wondered aloud. The girl had only been a few years younger than I was at that time. Mother wrinkled her brow. Ella, she explained, had been murdered. It was horrible, she said. A man had taken an axe and chopped her to pieces. I couldn't believe it. When I asked her for more details, Mother said she didn't know much else about it. Like all other bad things in the family, no one had ever talked about it. It was their way to cope, she explained. And so for me, on that day, the mystery began. Soon after that visit, I began the long journey that led me more than a quarter of a century later to write this book. Along the way, I discovered that many other people are held captive by the mystery, too. In fact, I discovered that the story of Ella Barham and Otis Davidson ignites interest, provokes emotion, and intrigues people of all ages and from all walks of life. When claiming its audience, it does not discriminate. At the heart of the story are universal themes of human nature that connect us emotionally. The need to feel safe, to be secure, and to find trust in others. The need for stability and order to prevail over chaos. The hope that good triumphs over evil, and a belief in the sense of knowing right from wrong. While these themes can be applied to most any crime, what makes this story unique is the setting and time in which it occurred in contrast to the particularly heinous nature of the crime. To write this account of the murder and the resulting investigation, trial, appeal, and hanging, I drew upon hundreds of newspaper accounts written during the time. The circuit court trial testimony and related documents the Arkansas Supreme Court case file and other legal records, and endless stacks of historical documents, maps, history and law books, personal family documents, and genealogical records in an attempt to reconstruct and recreate the truest, least sensationalized, non-fiction version of what happened during that time over a 100 years ago. In my quest to uncover the truth, I spoke with many people who claimed to have knowledge of the crime in some way. Members of my Barham family shared what they knew, but one cousin in particular, Hazel Young Dean, provided the most information. Her mother was Gertie Barham, Ella's sister, and her father was Ed Young, who testified at the circuit court trial. From Hazel, I learned who Ella's immediate family believed killed Ella and why. In addition to my Barham family, I spoke with members of the Davidson family, descendants of those directly involved in the trial, and descendants of people who lived in Boone County when the murder and trial occurred. While I hoped to gain special secret family insights, these efforts, with few exceptions, did little more than cost time and lead me to dead ends. Although several members of the Davidson family spoke freely with me about the crime and were willing to share what little they knew, others were reticent. Instead, they chose to hold steadfast in their belief that Otis Davidson, their relative, was innocent. A great-great-granddaughter of Elbridge Jerry Mitchell, the attorney who defended Davidson until the very end, was happy to correspond with me on and off for years, but would never talk about her ancestor. The granddaughter of Augustus Cleveland Sewell, the prosecuting attorney, knew nothing about Sewell, had no pictures or family stories to share, and didn't want any either. A great-grandson of Judge George William Reed, the judge who presided at the circuit court trial in Harrison, was more congenial. He wanted to help me. For more than a decade, he was happy to share information and stories with me about his entire family, but he knew very little about the murder and was unable to find relatives who did. 
Descendants of Dr. George Washington Taylor, the doctor who examined Ella after her death, were willing to share what they knew about their ancestor, but they didn't know much about the murder. When I compared the stories of those who did talk with me about the murder to the source materials from 1912 and 1913, I concluded that the facts laid out in family histories had become distorted over time, although Hazel Dean's narrative stood out as a rare exception. Furthermore, some of these people stubbornly refused to accept any version of the story except the one that they had already heard and believed to be gospel. As I reflect on that approach, I can't help but recall the childhood game wherein one child whispers something into the ear of another child, who then whispers it to another, and so forth, until finally the last child reveals what he or she heard and it is never what the original child said. The story of Ella Barham and Otis Davidson has evolved into folklore. Consequently, I chose to rely almost exclusively on primary, legal, and academic sources to write this book. However, even some of those sources required interpretation and thought. Newspapers from the time were vital, but due to the prevalence of sensationalism in the press, Reports were sometimes exaggerated and conflicted. To recreate the events of the murder, trial, and appeal that I describe in this book, I leaned especially hard on the transcript of the circuit court trial and the case record in the Arkansas Supreme Court, both of which I consider to be the sources closest to the truth. However, these sources were not always complete or easy to decipher. The prosecution's brief was missing from the Arkansas Supreme Court's case record. When reading the transcript of the circuit court trial, I often became frustrated. Important questions were not asked, and some testimony that appeared crucial was not pursued. Meaningless questions were asked during the trial, especially by the defense, possibly intended to confuse or distract the jurors. Some testimony seemed to have no purpose and drew no conclusions. I worked long and hard to evaluate what I had found and to ferret out what I believed important. During this exercise, I gained great respect for the words of historian Brooks Belevins, who observed, The historian, like the judge and the jury in a trial, is to some degree always at the mercy of her sources. Even under the best conditions, History is an inexact science, if not a highly evolved form of art. Despite my best efforts in this book, some questions remain unanswered. While writing this book, I learned that to truly understand the significance of the events connected to this crime, an understanding of the society and culture in which Ella lived is crucial. To that purpose, in addition to the details of the crime and the events that sprang from it, this account is infused with local history, short biographies, and descriptions of life in the Arkansas Ozarks during those times. Through the years, the people of the rural Arkansas Ozarks have been portrayed as ignorant, backwoods hillbillies. Lazy, clannish, violent, inbred, racist, superstitious, dirty, poor, barefooted, and perpetually drunk on moonshine. This region of the Upland South has its defenders, though their depiction of the people sometimes seems equally distant from reality, conjuring up a more romantic view and describing the rural Ozarks as a place of simplicity and innocence, frozen in time. In reality, people in Boone County in 1912, the year Ella died, were accustomed to hard work. Most were farmers. Rising early and retiring early were a way of life. Families were usually large, and each member had a job to do. It wasn't an easy life, but it was respectable. Folks from these areas were well acquainted with one another. Often they were related either by blood or by circumstance. Most were proud people, strong of body, mind, and spirit, fiercely independent, 
and determined to improve their lot in life. Within their immediate communities, there existed a strong sense of trust, friendship, and fellowship, bound together by common need. In good times and in bad, neighbors were there for one another. Oftentimes, their lives depended on it. When Ella Barham was murdered and one of her neighbors was hanged for the crime, the lives of the members of the Pleasant Ridge community and those surrounding it were turned upside down. No longer did people feel safe or secure. No longer could they trust one another. All innocence that dwelt in their hearts was extinguished by the horror that originated from within their own community. The crime made them realize their world was not immune from the evil they read about in larger cities. They learned that people who commit unspeakable crimes can live anywhere and may even be people they know. Ella Barham has been largely forgotten. As is true today, the perpetrator of a crime usually gets more attention than the victim. In Ella's case, this was confirmed for me when I saw a publication produced in 2016 that included several pictures of Ella and Otis. Although Otis's name was spelled correctly, Ella was identified as Edna. That was the turning point for me. It inspired the title and format of my book.